kind of represents in uh, the context of education, health, community health, things like that. Um, so now uh, we, we uh, are very involved in policy work. So SWAP is also a mass-based political organization. So we were thinking, well, how can we be involved politically in the food justice sector, you know, with a food justice lens? And uh, this year, actually, we were very successful. We helped push uh, SB 80, which was um, New Mexico-grown produce for school meals and trying to get more New Mexico-grown produce and money for more uh, grown produce to go into our school lunches so that New Mexico kids can eat food that's grown in New Mexico by New Mexico farmers. And it helps stimulate the economy, it helps support just eating and being healthy, um, and currently it's sitting on the governor's desk, so if you're a New Mexican, you know, you could call the governor and say, hey, you should, you know, pass this, we need this. Uh, we also help support the uh, New Mexico Farmers Market Association and getting more money uh, to do more farmers markets across the state, to have more infrastructure for uh, SNAP, the food stamp access, uh, for WIC, for incentives, to maybe you double your money when you come shop with your food stamps, things like that. Um, so they were awesome. And um, you know the genetic engineered labeling bill, you know that unfortunately didn't make it through this year, but hopefully we'll continue to work and build, you know, capacity to support that. And that's a big political struggle. I mean, to get that kind of passed, and it seems kind of a no-brainer to me because I've studied it and it just makes sense to label what's in our food. But for other, you know, people and organizations, it's they don't want it. So it's going to be a battle politically. And so when we think of battling, we think of phone calling, we think of talks like this. This is really us in the struggle. In Spanish, you call it la lucha, you know, or the movimiento, the, the movement of people and social justice. So these are kind of the things we're focusing on in that realm um, through our organization. And then in the schools, we're in about eight schools, um, mainly the West Side Cluster, you know, in Albuquerque, the West Side Cluster, West Mesa Cluster, and then the Highland Cluster up in the Southeast Heights in the International District, because that's where our community garden started. Um, we kind of have a different level of schools, you know, we uh, either come in and give a talk on food justice or eating healthy or, you know, something like that, Two, we work with schools every week, doing after school garden clubs, things like that, and we're trying to tighten up and get more involved with curriculum development, working with principals, working with educational leadership in the administration to say, hey, let's get kids out in the garden, let's do more lessons in the garden. The principal at Curran Elementary actually, I think, made every teacher have at least one lesson that's connected to the garden, which is just amazing. And uh, we can get in that more conversation later. Uh, just to kind of end, because I know I only got a couple minutes, is we started last year Feed the Hood Farms. So I am the farm manager for Feed the Hood Farms, and it's an earned income component to support all that other work that we're doing in the schools and policy, things like that. So we have a farm in the South Valley, uh, 805 Riverside Drive and we're trying to grow food and sell it at farmers markets, to different networks, things like that, to earn income to support food justice work because we think it's really important and we want to actually build infrastructure and capacity from our own uh, accord as instead of getting foundation money, which nonprofits traditionally do and are relying on you know, foundation support. So we want to kind of mix it. We think foundation support is very important and can support this work, but also let's make some of our own money and support this work and keep building capacity. And it's just blowing up right now. I mean, it's springtime, you can feel it, it's sprouting, you know, so uh, I think it's a really good thing. So it's pretty much the work that we do. Um, and also I'll just kind of end too that I think this is important because if you studied this, when we first introduced chemicals into growing food, it was because they were left over from war. You know, they were leftover chemicals that were used to do bombs and all this. And so basically I see it as a warlike mentality towards Mother Earth. In a sense, our food industry and corporations have declared war on Mother Earth using these chemicals. So it's, it's no different than war human to human. Now it's war human to nature. And we are actually destroying our planet through these chemicals, through this use of these chemicals. So, you know, that's kind of how I see it, that, you know, we're, we're in the lucha being protectors and guardians of good stewardship of Mother Earth. You know, we're, we are, see the importance of it, and we, we need to just spread it as much as we can. So that's why we work with community, with youth, just to talk about this, just to simply, let's say, let's take care of the Earth, and let's study how we can all do our part to keep this thing going, because I think that's what community represents, is that everybody does what they can, um, kind of in support of that common good, of that common good for Mother Earth, so. Thank you, I'm sure we have more there.
Adam, thank you so much for coming, and thank you, um, Sarah and Jessica, for helping put this whole conference on. I know it takes a lot of work. I know personally how much work it takes to put on a conference, and so I thank you for all the like, work and logistics and everyone else who's on the organizing and volunteer committee. I know there's a lot of behind the scenes people too we don't often see. Um, so that's a rooster in my front yard that I'm trying to catch. I wonder if there's a, oh, here we go. This is from Cesar Chavez Day of Service. Um, we were using some drumming to help um, let kids know when to change the stations. Like Trevi said, this is yesterday, we had 350 students on Sanchez Farm and then an additional 50 volunteers making this event happen. That's my co-manager and partner, April, and our board member, Jessica Mills, and her daughter, Maya. They are instructing kids on how to plant potatoes um, in our field there at Sanchez Farms. There's uh, middle school and elementary school kids who participate in the stations, and 50 high school students who are really the leaders helping with the flow. This is a model of a watershed. Do you want me to scroll this down? No, I just want to go through it quickly. This is a, um, some wetlands planting with Colleen from Bernalillo County Open Space. And they were um, part of Sanchez Farms as a stormwater runoff and a wetlands area that we're continuing to rehabilitate and protect. And there's several different species of ducks and geese and hawks that come to the farm, cranes in the winter. Um, these are water bottles, plastic water bottles, and they smash together to build this amazing greenhouse. This is La Placita Institute's project there that day. 12 different organizations come and put on different workshops from hand broadcasting seeds to cover crop the field to learning about compost, learning about worms and vermiculture. Um, Travis does a, a, a talk on the Isekia system. The Isekia is water all the South Valley plots. So I just wanted folks to see a little recent, very recent demonstration <laughs> of the work we do uh, before we get in. This is the Sanchez farm site. That's just a small sliver of it. It's quite large. Um, it's basically uh, put on by a combination of Bernalillo County Open Space, La Placita Institute, and ourselves, Erda Gardens and Learning Center, with additional support from organizations who come in to help put on workshops and things like that. So this is just a little sliver of what we do um, at Erda Gardens and Learning Center. We started in 1996. Our founder was a radical Franciscan nun named okay. Marie Nord. She was an anti-war activist, anti-poverty activist. She decided instead of railing against the system, she wanted to create a new project that was beautiful and strong. So she started a garden in someone's backyard, basically, in the North Valley. Sarah, I think you should maybe... Can we pause it somewhere? Yeah, pause. Pause on the rooster. Okay. I'm going to catch that rooster. I'm slowly <laughs> domesticating him. We have feral chickens in our street. And um, I know that if I just keep feeding him a little bit of scratch, him and his, um, him and his lady friend, they're both those six black and white speckled, they're gonna come over into the farm and be a part of it, I know. I want those feral hens, because you know one of the things we've done is we've bred out of chickens their ability to like brood and hatch their own chicks. And so, you know, we, it's part of the unsustainable part of the farm is like buying seeds every year, buying chicks every year. So really wanting to like, gather that wild um, instinct and harvest it <laughs> for the farms for the farm's benefit so we can have our own um, chicks every year that we don't buy from a hatchery somewhere else. So you know part of part of Marie's vision was to to create a community supported agriculture project. It was the first one in Albuquerque and to really foster foster a a design of agriculture that that is really a spiritual practice. We practice biodynamic agriculture, and so we use different homeopathic medicines that we develop from composts and herbs on the garden. Our mission is really restorative agriculture, so not looking at the earth to say, what can you provide for me, but really how can we work to heal the earth? I just really want to echo what Travi said, that we are you know, at war right now with our Mother Earth, and to shift that paradigm into a restoration and a healing paradigm uh, is gonna take a tremendous amount of work, but fortunately, our ancestors have laid that groundwork for us, and all we need to do is look back to those practices and remember them. And so I was fortunate enough to have grandparents who taught me about composting and planting potatoes, and I know many um, young agrarians, as we're calling ourselves today, have also had that ancestral presence in their life. But many, many youth are 
are without that. And so we are trying to create a space where we can bring back those traditional practices, pass that on to our kids and the next generation in a way that they can use to continue this work when we're done. So youth is a very important part of what we're doing on the farm. We are completely membership-based. Um, we're kind of the opposite of what Travis is saying. It's like we're just now sort of thinking, well, maybe we should write a grant for something. <laughs> because all of our funding is grassroots right now. It's 100% from our membership. So people either buy into the farm with money or they buy into the farm with their work. And in exchange, they get 25 weeks of produce, whatever we harvest that week, usually five to 10 different uh, varieties of fruits, vegetables, and herbs. And so, you know, we're just sort of now looking into that like grant writing piece and trying to expand the work that we do with young people. One of our new projects is a historic apple and pear orchard in the South Valley. It's about 50 years old, and it had been neglected for maybe 15 years. And so the growth of invasives like elms and mulberries around those apple trees, and these apple trees, I don't know if you can imagine a 50-year-old apple tree, maybe some of you have seen one, they're like this thick. And, and they are, um, you know, the, the mass of 100 trees that big in this area, it's not only historic and beautiful, it's like a forest. You know, uh, it's, it's also a really um, precious ecosystem and could be a food source for our community. And so 15 years of neglect, um, some of those elms and mulberries are this thick. You know, we did a lot of work with hand tools, but also had a lot of volunteer support with chainsaws to pull that wood out um, and give those trees room, space, air, and light to breathe. And it's been a really um, magical process. The community has really come forward to help restore this orchard and to help purchase the orchard in a way that would seem illogical to many people. <laughs> and I say that because a lot of times in the nonprofit world, it's like you write the grant and then you start the project or you think that's too big of a project, we can't do that. Um, and those things, I think, those voices, we need to just put those aside for a moment and we need to listen to the other voices. And the other voices are the voices of our mother earth and of these trees and of the spirits that live in the grasses and the cranes and the migratory birds that come through the South Valley, and they're asking us, please do this work. It's more important to do this work than it is for your brain to say it's impossible. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that is the story of the orchard. We just completed um, you know, spring pruning. The trees are just about to bloom. For those of you who live in the area, I entreat you, please, um, you know, we have a work day at the end of this month. We'll have a, actually Saturday, Sunday, combination work day at the end of this month. So please come visit the orchard. Help us with a, a chipping project. We're going to chip some of that wood and put the mulch back on the trees and dry spots to protect them from, from the dryness of our climate. Um, so let me see. There was a few other things I did want to say. Please uh, visit our website, www.urdagardens.org. That is a great place to find more information on our CSA. I do have some, some bro a few brochures and flyers today, but you can find more information on our community-supported agriculture projects at CSA. Mm -hmm. If you live in a community that has a CSA, community-supported agriculture project, please join it. It is the best way that you can support a farm, know your farmer, see exactly where your food is grown and the practices in which it's grown with, and participate in the farm. There's a lot of subscription farms where you pay and then the box arrives at your door, but do you get to engage with those vegetables? Do you see how much that farm is wasting in plastic materials every year? Do you meet the farmers who are growing the food and know the heart and prayer that they're putting into that? So, you know, I just encourage people to really, to join a CSA, but to participate in that CSA, to be on the farm, because I really believe that the act of farming changes you on a spiritual level. For thousands of years, we have been deeply rooted and connected to our food source. It is only in very recent history that we are so disconnected, and only really in certain cultures, because many places in the world, people still have this profound connection. And I was recently at the National Biodynamic uh, Farming Conference in Madison, Wisconsin, and one of the things I heard from the keynote there, Charles Eisenstein, who maybe some of you have heard of, he's um, doing a lot of writing and work on barter economy and new economies and maybe the transition out of capitalism. And one of the things that he said is that people are not greedy, people are hungry. And we really are craving this connection, community connection, spiritual connection, land connection. And so many of the things that we do, that, we, that people do, um, that can be perceived as greedy is actually a hunger for this nurturance, for this community. 
And we really try to foster that in our organization, creating spaces like potlucks, um, you know, parties, you know, the farm is a social organism, so people can really connect with each other as well as where their food comes from. Um, I think that the last thing I just want to say is, you know, one thing that I, I, I don't consider myself a, a pure anthroposophist. I really love the writings of Rudolf Steiner, but my worldview is much too broad to just hold his ideas um, as the single unified answer. But one of the things he said that I think echoes in many cultures and spiritual traditions is that there is no matter without spirit, and there's no spirit without matter. And so even the clouds and the wind and the rain tapping on the leaves and your hands in the dirt affect the earth. And so I just want you to, if nothing else, hold that with you when you leave and go back into your communities to foster that profound spiritual connection that you have and to foster it in other people who might come to your farm. share a little bit about my research, but I kind of want to touch on some of the experiences that have informed that um, and gotten me here. So a few years ago, I participated in the UNM Bluechad Field School, and it's a, a program that was a collaborative project from teachers all over the university here, with the intention of taking students around New Mexico to visit various processors, producers, distributors, uh, community development centers, and really gain an understanding of food here in New Mexico. And so we visited very small-scale community gardens, as, very, as well as very large-scale uh, agricultural um, farms that were producing food for export. And uh, it was really amazing to see the diversity of agriculture here in this space. And what was also really influential about this um, field school was just recognizing the opportunities that existed for people like myself who wanted to pursue a life or a career in food and agriculture. Um, so. Shortly after the field school, I also got involved with a program called WORF, um, which many of you have probably heard of, uh, which stands for Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms, and it helps connect people interested in farming with farms that are willing to host them. So you exchange your labor um, for room and board and a learning experience. <coughs> so I went, I spent a few short weeks out at Kingbird Farms in um, the Sacramento Valley, California. Um, so this is the farm from their water tower. And it's a pretty small farm, really great. They're producing a lot of food, mostly for themselves. Um, so I did a lot of food preservation, um, canning, fermenting, drying while I was there. But the couple that runs it is also really involved in community justice and um, social um, developments in that area. And so I got to go to a slow food fundraiser, um, a fundraiser for a farm and school program in Sacramento, as well as help put in some of the infrastructure for a community garden in Galt. Um, I also, about a year ago now, took part in the permaculture design course through the Permaculture Institute, and that was just an amazing program that really provided me with a lot of practical knowledge. So how do you build a grade water system, or what is a grade water system for you know, some people in the class, and um, how do you graft trees, what are some mulching and composting techniques? And so there was a lot of really great knowledge that came from that class. Um, we put together site plans, so this is part of our um, like our hardscapes and um, vegetation for the group that I worked with. Um, but in addition to these very like practical, specific kind of skills, we also learned some more general um, design principles and ethics that guide permaculture. And I really feel like these can be applied to any scale, from very personal all the way to business and industry. So, for example, there's a, a permaculture credit union in Santa Fe, which is a banking institution. That's 
Um, and so something else that I took from this class is I started to see the connections between permaculture and resilience. Um, and both of them have really shaped my own worldview about um, you know, things are changing and dynamic and how do we um, create systems that are really robust and can take care of themselves. Um, and so the last thing that I want to point out, um, I did an internship at Chispas Farm this past year. I was there from May through December. Um, and Chispas is a small organic farm here in Albuquerque, South Valley. It's about four acres. They grow a lot of heirloom varieties and are also really well known for their um, garlic. garlic. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, and so this was a great opportunity to get that hands on. Um, I, at this point, up until this point, I really had spent a prolonged period of time working on a farm. So eight months was amazing and I live there as well. Um, and so I got to work with some amazing people. There's Marjorie in this picture, um, and really learned about you know what it takes to prep fields and put in your irrigation system and planting and caring for your plants and then harvesting and taking that to market. So really the whole whole spectrum um, of running a farm. And I really feel like the knowledge that I gained, I at least have a, a you know starting ground. If I wanted to do this on my own, I could. Um, but something else that really came up during this time was business side of farming and I was like well, how does this work how do you make connections with restaurants how do you actually sell your goods um, and that definitely influenced me as I was coming into the, the geography program here last fall um, so coming in I had this kind of general question of how do we foster resilient farms and communities um, and the business part of it's there you know people want to be able to make a living off of what they do but there's other factors that influence success of farms. So the, the land stewardship and just like the personal agency and the power of your own um, in your own life. And so as I started to you know narrow down my, my research project, all of that you know was influencing me. And so currently I am working on a project to talk with small farms here in Albuquerque um, and talk with farmers about what their successes and limitations are um, and how those influence whether or not they continue farming. And then use that information, you know, to, to provide some insight to resilience, which kind of coming from an academic setting and is one way of evaluating success and is really useful, um, but perhaps misses some of the human component at times. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm at. up in Santa Fe called the Kibera Coalition. Kibera was an organization founded in 1997, right at the peak of the grazing wars between the conservation community, environmental community, and the agriculture community. And it was founded by a rancher and two environmentalists, one of whom was um, Kibera's longtime executive director, Courtney White. Courtney will actually be speaking later this evening at, the, at this conference here. But Courtney, I, I love the quote he says when he left the um, Sierra Club and started the Kibera Coalition, he left the conflict industry, which I think is sort of an interesting way to think about sort of the, the, the state of affairs in 1997 was there was there the, what we have here today that we can have a conference that's both about sort of taking care of the planet and about agriculture simultaneously was not really a conversation. Um, it was a conversation that, you know, as these guys talked about that have been involved in um, native and traditional communities, but the sort of more mainstream community had lost that connection between the two. And so Kibera was founded right at a, a really <coughs> important time to sort of start to build back um, connections between uh, conservation and agriculture, and specifically around ranching. So the organization brought together and created a place that um, a fellow at the Malpai Borderlands Group, a group down in 
in southern Arizona called the Radical Center. So lots of noise <coughs> on the extremes, lots of sort of shouting and, and unpredictive, unproductive, uncivil dialogue at the extremes. But Kivera really served as a place where people involved in agriculture and conservation could come together and have conversations about how you make land healthier in, in, in southwestern systems, which was an important conversation to have at that point. So over the last 16 years, the organization has um, uh, evolved, gotten involved in restoration projects, work out on the Navajo Nation, um, big annual conference every year here in Albuquerque. This year's theme is inspiring adaptation. Um, but one of the things that, you know, in, in all of these relationships that Kibera was creating, it was a, you know, building this incredible toolbox of how do we take care of uh, Western range landscapes using uh, um, domesticated herbivores to mimic the way that natural herbivores use a landscape and, and think about the way that uh, grassland systems can be healthier because of um, herbivory as opposed to sort of, you know, like the cattle three and 93 movement. Um, but when I came to the organization in nine, or in 2007 as an intern, one of the things that, that um, the organization hadn't put as much thought into it at that point yet was, so we have this incredible skill set of ranchers who are doing this incredible work and conservationists who are acknowledging food systems as important parts of an ecosystem. Um, but where, who's, who's, gonna, who's gonna do this next? And <coughs> that next generation was really missing from Kimara's work. So I came in 2007 and started the new agrarian program. Um, at that point it was called the CARLY program, Conservation and Ranching Leadership and Youth, which is a terrible acronym. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad we lost it. It actually caused people to call me CARLY, which <laughs> was so, um, But we started this program on one ranch up in um, Colorado. I'm actually gonna pass a brochure, one each way. Um, and uh, with one ranch up in the San Luis Valley, George Witten and Julie Sullivan. Julie had been a professor in the Audubon Expedition Program, I think George and Julie, um, which was, you know, she was a vegetarian environmentalist, cattle free in 93, met George Witten and fell in love with somebody who made his living by being a grass farmer and taking care of Western landscapes and using cattle as his tool. And so we started the apprenticeship program there and um, really, sort of set to work on, you know, it was, we knew we needed to train the next generation. The average age of farmer rancher today in the United States is 57, in New Mexico it's 60, so there is an urgent need to do, you know, exactly what, what these guys are doing is getting young people involved in agriculture. Um, our program, we really felt like, it, rather than it being for people, young people who were at a phase where they were just sort of coming in and saying, is this what I wanna do? We needed to take that next step and have it be really dedicated because of the sources of grant funding, we needed success, we needed people to come to this program and say, this is what I am going to do. I need a learning, I need a really intensive learning opportunity. So I'm gonna read a quick passage from, uh, we put together this this really, it's, in, it's a Word document that we <laughs> published, it's not a fancy book, but sort of tried to really think through what apprenticeship meant and how we created in a successful apprenticeship program. The word apprentice and the, the sort of the, the idea of an apprenticeship is, um, is somewhat lost today. There are some fields like um, uh, electrical engineering where you do a, you know apprenticeship and journeyman. There's sort of a, there's a progression in um, some trades, and but agriculture has really lost that that uh, really <coughs> deep sense of um, you have to you know put in your time and, and learning from a mentor and, and contributing to a mentor's operation. So I'll just read a quick passage here. Once upon a time, apprenticeship was the primary form of education available to a person, whatever the field, medicine, music, cobbler, or scholar. Not necessarily a beginner, but not yet a master. An apprentice agreed to work for a specific length of time for a master craft person in a craft or trade in return, in return for instruction. The agrarian apprenticeship is a form of this age-old process by which the learner becomes the practitioner. An experiential agrarian apprenticeship differs from conventional edu education and traditional employment relationships in a number of ways. An apprenticeship is a learning partnership and its success is dependent upon the quality of the relationship between the learner and teacher. The learner and the teacher share responsibility for the education process. Apprentices are actively involved in planning and implementing their own learning. They're self-directed and self-motivated. They seek out ways to immediately use their knowledge Mentors serve as teachers in the normal sense of the word, passing on their knowledge and teaching specific skills. 
They also act as guides, creating a learning environment that is both supportive and challenging. And perhaps most important of all, an apprenticeship is most effective for both mentor and apprentice when they're invested in one another as people, valued for their respective abilities as well as their personal character. In short, an agrarian apprenticeship is a whole person education, offering professional training for a livelihood that requires a person to become a jack or jill of all trades. A rancher needs to know how to pull a calf, as well as how to resolve a conflict with a neighbor. A farmer needs to be able to advocate for farm right to farm legislation, as well as know how to sow new seeds. Therefore, a new agrarian educator must foster the development of the practical, technical, that are the essential to a life of working with the land, as well as cultivate the interpersonal that are equally necessary for success. So that was, that was sort of, that was our biggest challenge in putting this together. We could find ranchers across the Southwest with Thank You Bears Network who were doing everything right, who were, you know, who were holistically managing organic, using humane treatment of animals, using grass-fed marketing techniques. That was sort of, those, those kind of folks are a dime a dozen within our community. But really trying to um, identify what made for a really good mentor-apprentice apprentice relationship and trying to, you know, formalize that in a way that we could replicate it on many different operations all over the Southwest was really, really our challenge. And that, um, it is, is proved to be a, a, a very successful program for, I guess we're now in the fifth year, graduated nine folks. We have just selected our 2013 apprentices and they're up and running as of two weeks ago. Um, so it is, we've, we've definitely, um, I think, achieved success in our program. There's some things that, you know, I've now moved, I'm, I'm no longer, this, all the photos up here are photos that I took. That used to be my job. I used to just go out there, and now I'm the executive director, which is a boring job. <laughs> it is a fundraising job, and I've turned this program over to a really remarkable, a uh, good friend of mine who's now running it, and she is starting to think through sort of, okay, so we have a great foundation, and we have, you know, mentor operations that are up and running, and we have graduated apprentices who are going on to careers either managing other people's agricultural operations or starting operations on their own. And one of the things that she's really helping me do is think through sort of what are the places where um, where this program isn't meeting all of the needs that it could. And that's that's one of the places I'm really, when we have the discussion after, I'm really eager for feedback. Um, things that come to mind for me. So we have, the way this program works is Kibera writes grants and we make a grant to a mentor operation so the mentor can pay a stipend. We really believe pretty firmly that we don't want to make this program available only to people who um, are free of school debt and you know don't have any expenses or somebody else is covering them, that we pay a stipend that makes it so uh, participants in our program can have a living wage is, is pretty important. But it does mean we have scale issues. In, in five years, we've graduated nine students. I mean, these guys yesterday, you guys had 350 students out on the land. So I struggle with sort of how do you you know, investing a, a fair bit of resources, although I'm still modest, I think, in one individual for a really intensive one year experience, and then they go out and they manage, you know, a 300,000 acre piece of ground. I think there's a, a good conservation benefit, but I'm, I'm struggling with sort of how do, we, how do we take it to scale? One of the ways that we're doing that is we produce this very fancy Word document. <laughs> um, and our, it's a handbook for both mentor and apprentice. It's sort of the brain dump of everything we've learned in the process of creating this apprenticeship program. And how do you find the right person? What are the questions you ask yourselves? What are the questions you ask somebody that's coming to you? Similarly for the apprentice. Um, I'll just sort of scroll through here. Oops. Anyway. Um, uh, are you a, a good fit for this mentor operation? Are you a good fit? Are you a good fit to have an apprentice? Is, or um, uh, is teaching one of your priorities? Or do you just need help? And really being honest with yourself and asking those kind of questions. Similarly, for the for the apprentice side, what are you looking for an educational experience? Or are you really just looking for a few key skills? Are you looking for you know? So it, it just sort of a handbook that asks helps us ask a lot of those questions and then provides. Here's a sample contract. Nobody, there are so many contracts that we do, nobody has to spend any time writing one of these. Just go and, <laughs> so we're trying to make as many of these resources, a sample curriculum, um, a sample skills assessment, uh, just trying to you know, think through all of the documents that might make somebody else running an apprenticeship independent of our program easier. Um, the second challenge that I really 
um, feel strongly about is sort of the financial resilience of this program. You know, it is dependent at this point upon philanthropy, um, which is, you know, we have been successful in writing grants and, and getting <coughs> money for young folks to have this educational experience, but um, we're starting to think now, is there some process by which the mentor enters, the mentor operation enters into our program for four to five years, and at the end of that, we have helped them build a resilient mentorship operation that is actually producing enough income in, in having a mentorship program that they can then graduate from our program and make space for another person. We actually are building, rather than apprentices being our final end product of, of the program, we have mentor operations that are capable of running their own programs. And the third, the third component that I'm really want to think a lot more about is, you know, you watch the photos go by, it is, there are, this program is not meeting the needs of underserved communities. This is largely attracting um, people who are a lot like me, who grew up on the East Coast or who grew up in communities who are well educated, who are, you know, who have, you know, some resources to be able to take a year and do this kind of program. And we're really, as an organization, trying to think through, you know, how do we partner with groups that are successfully serving people of color. We have uh, 2042 is the year that white Americans will become the minority in the, US, in the United States. And we have um, an agricultural community that already is not principally white. And so that our program looks that way to me still is, is one of those things that's sort of eating at me. So that, those are the, that's the sort of, you know, I could show you all the pretty pictures and it's you know, a good program. But those are the things that as we have a conversation that I'm really eager for. scale in that they cover lots of acres. They're all operations that are just run by two people plus their apprentice. They're definitely sort of, the landscapes are massive, but the size of the operations are, are uh, they're laughable in the cattle industry. <laughs> um, and most of Cubera's ranches are. So 
Um, but at this point, we are, um, Kibera saw a unique niche in being connected with a, with a uh, sustainable ranching community to set up this kind of ranching apprentice. Um, duplicating the effort that these guys are doing is not, it, it's not what Kibera would be best at. And you know, there are groups that are already doing it really well. We are, we have uh, the ranch apprentice in um, Colorado. We have a, a cheese making apprenticeship in Durango. We have a, um, just this year started a, uh, heirloom orchard um, uh, operation with Tuli's Trees up in Truchas, New Mexico. Um, we've got a, a sort of a permaculture ranch focus down in um, Arizona. So n nothing urban. Um, but our new program director, that's one of her, it's one of the things she's really excited about. We, we wouldn't do it without sort of being an explicit partnership because it's not, that's not, it's not through the organization. It's not where our strengths are. But we have a good program that I think has a good model, and that you know, in combination with a group like you guys, would, would I think would create a pretty successful partnership. Yeah, I'll just jump on that too because for young agrarians, you know, a lot of our urban youth don't get the experience of even seeing food grow. I mean, I've worked with tons of kids that have never even put their hands in soil, you know, or never seen food grow. So I think that's a big thing. And internships, we've we've gotten a couple. We've done it, I think, the last two years trying to give just small <laughs> educational stipends to youth to participate in our farming program over the summer months. Um, and it's been awesome, the youth are awesome, they help us harvest, they help us plant, we get to teach them all about that. They go to the market, the farmer's market, and work the farmer's market, get that kind of experience. But you know, it's building capacity, and I think in this panel it's great to say that we need, we need help building capacity for this kind of work because however you can plug in and make this happen, the better, you know, foundation, we're trying to get more foundation support, you know, us make more money so we can do that. But that's in our philosophy is that, yeah, we need to create youth opportunities that can, they can express themselves and learn and develop into, you know, potentially young farmers. And I think right now it's not very uh, prevalent in our society to say, hey, yeah, you can be a farmer when you grow up. You know, it's really, you know, unfortunately in America, we don't really have this honorable, you know, valuable label on farmers. It seems like they're always in the shadows or, you know, they're big agricultural mm -hmm. things, you know, with uh, tractors and all that. So, you know, <coughs> even just telling the story of food and, you know, mm -hmm. growing food, like everybody in this room can go shop at farmer's market. And this, this fear of influence, you know, you can tell friends about shopping at farmer's markets and going to the farm, knowing your farms, or you can, you know, help start after school programs, you know, get involved, start garden at a school, you know, these kinds of things that we need to create young farmers. And, you know, for us, we are concentrated on low income communities of color, and we want to teach kids that they can grow food at their homes. And, you know, some of that entails, you know, some kids don't even have homes, some kids are in apartment complexes, some of our kids are very transient. So how do we, you know, just, how do we do more of that so kids can enjoy and learn those skills to grow their own food and, and feed themselves? Because, you know, in a nutritional context, that's the best. We need a lot of urban farmers just grow and have little tomato plants and grow your own squash. And, you know, the more we can do that, I think the better off we'll be as a society. And the kids play an important role in that because not only can they apply what they're learning in school into the garden, but that's like life lessons. You know, you learn how to take care of the earth. You learn how to sow. You learn how to do all these things that seem to be disappearing in our education system. And that's another thing that we have to do is concentrate on curriculum for our young people that they get to experience this kind of thing. Like somebody was saying that the day of service learning happens once a year, that could be every Friday, where kids go out to local farms and just do cool things, you know, grow food. <laughs> <laughs> Not, you know, logistically, <laughs> 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 but just philosophically, <laughs> philosophically, philosophically, you know, our kids are yes. out in nature. They're not out yeah. learning things in, in the, you know, growing food. Like, I'm, one of my friends called it nature deficit disorder, that our kids are cool. being robbed, yeah, <laughs> being robbed of the experiencing nature and just, you know, that kind of thing. What about for it? Like, I recently grew up in Boulder, Colorado, right? We have a walking five acres. So we focused our whole life on 4-H and then FFA programs. And both of my girls took that, you know, from an urban environment and went into, they're not farmers, but they're into alternative, you know, agriculture, et cetera. Do you have that in the South Valley? We have 4 H for sure, and mm -hmm. I had access to that when I was a kid. But I think what Travis is talking about, and I feel like this is more and more important, is connecting to schools because our school system is so sick and malnourished right now. And 
so the more that as community members, even if you don't have kids in a school system, mm -hmm. even as community members, when we can step up and make that link between schools and gardens or schools and farms, that is a really powerful link because every kid hopefully is going to school. And so they can have access to that. Whereas 4-H, you might have to have a supportive parent, you might have to have a ride there, you might have to pay membership, mm -hmm. you know, all those things that are barriers to low-income communities. Mm -hmm. And so if we can link more and work more with schools, either bringing schools on the farm, and Travis, you're absolutely right. It's like the biggest barrier when I talk to schools about coming to visit the farm is they don't have money to rent school buses. Mm -hmm. So APS schools are like, well, it's $250, there's a monopoly on a school bus, we can't drive them ourselves, it's like over 25 kids, there's all these rules. And so if we just have $250 and like 100 bucks to pay a couple facilitators for the day, $350, a school can visit the farm. It's so, so, it could be so simple, you know, to make those connections. And I just wanna echo, you know, what Trevi said, is we need like an army of farmers right now. You know, we just need so many people gardening in their own backyard, in their own farm, in their own project, so that we can really be self-sustainable when it comes to growing food for our communities. And, you know, I, I would hesitate to compare like what you guys are doing with like the Cesar Chavez Day of Service because it's it feels really superficial. And what you're talking about is this really in-depth learning piece. And that's more like what we do with our, our youth interns is spend like a whole season with them so they can come to market and be a part of all the parts of the process. And that to me feels really different. Like that's that's like five or ten kids who get that, you know, solid time investment and those deep learning skills versus 350 kids who get 30 minutes at, at three different stations. Mm -hmm. It's like, almost nothing, you know. I mean, it gives them that awe and that sense of wonder and plants that seed, but does it give them all the skills to do this as a livelihood? Like, no, it doesn't. It's just a taste. Yeah. So. Killing seeds. Sowing seeds. Sowing seeds. You know, like, uh, what I appreciate about this discussion today is it's not taking it all the way to, like, economic health related to food. I know that's a component of it. It needs to be, but a lot of times we get trapped into, okay, we want to get more farmers so we can have that be a large gener you know, income generator, which obviously is important. But I think for a lot of people, entry point is less about that and more about those cultural connections, with which all of you spoke to in different ways, and how that can really be, to me, more, more of the point than how many pounds of this you produce and how many acres of that are in cultivation, but like, you know, it's reestablishing those connections as you all have talked about. And so I'm just wondering, like, for all of you, or any, whoever wants to pick it up, like how, is the outcome so much the production of food or is it re-engaging with those cultural things? And what are, what are kind of the main entry points you see people coming from? Is it because they want to be out in the streets marching on Cesar Chavez Day and that leads them to farming or they're farming and it leads them to marching in the streets? kind of the balance you see with that? I, I know for our farm, a lot of the interest we get, um, especially from young people, is sort of what Avery was talking about, her profile, like, you know, college educated, a lot of folks from the East Coast um, seem to, you know, contact us and, you know, little or no farming experience, but, you know, not always. Uh, last week, we had a young woman who was born and raised in Albuquerque, but she's going to like Cornell and she basically dropped out of school because she wants to be a farmer. Her parents were really involved in, um, you know, in Erda back in the 90s when she was a little girl and she was like, you know, I'm in my classes and all I'm thinking about is how I want to be outside, I want to be growing food, I want to be connected to the earth, I want to see the fruits of my labor at the end of the day, instead of like typing on this computer where my shoulders get all tense and I feel like, you know, upset and anxious. And so I, I, I thought that was such an interesting, you know, conversation. I've had it over and over again with, with um, young people, and I really feel like there's a social movement mm -hmm. of people coming back to this kind of work. I think Trevisa is a career opportunity we could offer to young people. Like, you could be a farmer. This could be um, a place for you to, to build a career or a place to start, you know, as a food producer. And, and being producers is something that's kind of new in our in our culture because we're really taught to be consumers. And so for us to be producers means that we get to be um, like self-determining individuals. And so I think that's another thing that really draws people to this field as a possibility. Um, so, I don't know. Yeah, I, Go I feel like the, the last point that she made about um, being, you know, coming into this because you have power over your own life. Um, that's something 
thing that definitely drew me in and a lot of the other um, young people that I am close with um, getting into food because we realized, well, this is something we're really passionate about and we can have authority in our lives. Like we can make our own decisions, we can make our own hours, we don't have to sit in a cubicle somewhere. Um, and for some people that really works and that's great, but if that doesn't work for you, you can choose that too. So I think that authority in your own life is a big push. And that's something we all share too. It's, you know, everybody has an agrarian heritage. You know, somebody's grandma or great grandma, grandpa worked the land, survived with the land. So it's cultural roots that we all share. And I think, you know, connecting with that connects us. You know, we're, in a, we're all in the same room, all different walks of life, you know, different, uh, from different places. We might speak different languages, but we're all here together. And we, that's been a, a huge accomplishment, just to be together, you know? And, and so I think, you know, what's happening is we're unifying and we're, we're seeing what can we do more of, you know? So I think it's a balance of what you're saying. You know, we got to, Remember, and I think culture heals. You know, culture will heal everyone. Everybody has culture. But also, what, what can we do more of? You know, like, I was thinking a garden education position in schools, like a GE teacher that could complement <laughs> PE. You could be your GE teacher be like, I'm going to GE class. I'm going to garden education class. But, you know, it could be amazing, you know, or we're talking about the city infrastructure. Like, you know, we pay a bunch of city employees to just tend parks. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't we pay people to tend community gardens in these parks? You know, and use water in a more efficient way where it's producing something. Exactly, it's producing it's something. Well, and that's the other thing too. So, what policy changes? I mean, that's citywide, right? So, what, what what can we do to change that? I mean, I've seen those spray. They spray in like 4 a.m. So nobody knows about it. But you know, exactly. You know, those kinds of changes. And that's policy changes take a long time. But it it, it sprouts from you know this kind of conversation. I think we had a hand up back there too. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you guys. I've I've worked with kids who are in the foster care system and kids who have aged out and they're on their own and they're all, there's, we've got lots of them in New Mexico and they all are looking for a purpose. Purpose in life. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, trying to connect them with pets or to have something that they can love and learn. Well, for me, when I was a kid, it was plants. You know, I love plants and just all the animals. And I'm just wondering if maybe we can talk about the programs that you guys are working with, how, what your tolerance would be with these kids that are at high risk, starting to find something to be passionate about and to have a purpose in life, but they trip and fall constantly. And you know, if they have one success, a lot of times that's all they need to really find a purpose in life. But I work with, a, um, you know, we work I'm with the CASA organization, I'm with Court Appointed Special Advocates, and kids are in foster care. But it's Rio Arriba, um, Santa Fe, obviously it's statewide, but in Los Alamos counties, but I'd be really interested to talk to you guys to see if there's some way to bring these kids into, into this, because I just, yeah. yeah. I think it's so important just to see something grow, like you're saying. And I, I had the chance to go to the Academia de Esperanza. I don't know if anybody knows that school, but it's for super at-risk kids that, you know, we're talking, I mean, high schoolers that are multiple sex offenders and just, you know, violent incidents that have happened in <coughs> kids' lives. And, you know, I, this teacher that I went with, she was, like, really, like, cautious, like, you know, these kids, they can get out of control and this and that. I went in there, you couldn't even tell. They just loved hearing about food, hearing about you know the earth and growing stuff. And I think it's something like what you were just saying, it's something they can connect to that's successful too, that if you plant a seed and give it love, you can watch it grow. And you, there's so much learning in that act that you know, we have a thing called planting seeds for community needs. You know, and, and those kids have a, a lot of needs to just feel love and compassion and care and then reciprocate that because this is a reciprocal relationship that we have with the plant nation and with growing food is that it gives us so much and we try to give back, you know, it's like reciprocal, that it's constant. It is, and what Tiana said, you know, about uh, taking responsibility for your own life, I mean, that's the other thing. They've been told what to do by CYFD and juvenile justice and foster parents and all these things, but to take control of their own lives and grow their own food, oh my gosh, what a concept. What, you know, what a great way to make, to build self-esteem. So anyway, these ideas, you're just, I'm sitting here, <laughs> we had a question over here in the front. Oh yeah, this was just uh, kind of 
in, in regards to what you were saying about um, getting our society and especially our government infrastructure and stuff to start to do things in a more sustainable fashion. Um, and I um, have actually um, been participating with a group of <coughs> people in my community who are interested in um, creating an edible forest garden for our community. And um, I'll be giving a talk to our sustainability board, but our, so which is kind of cool that we have that. But um, I guess my question was kind of twofold. Um, first of all, um, in regards to, um, I think what you were talking about, what motivates people to, to make these sorts of decisions for themselves. I mean, I have all these uh, philosophical reasons why I think that a forest garden is what we need in our community, <coughs> but I don't necessarily think that, you know, if I go in there maybe with all of these sorts of things, like I could use a very similar argument for why I should be able to keep goats in my backyard, you know? And it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna convince anybody except for that maybe I'm crazy. Um, <laughs> and so, my question mainly for you, Amanda, right, mm -hmm. is, um, is uh, in your experience, when it comes to speaking to people, especially in government, running, uh, non working with a nonprofit and stuff, um, what motivates people to make the effort for that sort of change? And then secondly, for you, Travis, uh, when you were talking about um, you know, getting your local communities to participate in making these sorts of changes, um, what do you recommend as the most effective way to go about that sort of thing? I mean, right now, um, I'm talking with citizens, right? Do, do you recommend that we have a nonprofit who's backing us in this sort of effort so that we have someone creating the, you know, the, the volunteer support and all that sort of stuff to put the manpower behind these gardens? Um, questions like that, so. Um, you know, it helps to have, to identify your allies <coughs> in the government, institutions, whatever they may be, and to really foster those relationships. I don't think, you know, as my community organizer hat, um, I don't think that anything really gets done without fostering those relationships. Mm -hmm. So I really feel like that is the most important place to start. And without knowing, you know, much about the lay of the land or the community, I feel like that's the best I can give you because everyone's motivation is slightly different and um, you know I do have goats in my backyard so I could be listed as crazy um, <laughs> but I feel like you know sometimes I look at okay this is how much city water that we're wasting on like a golf course or a park you know or even like runoff that we could be harvesting for gardens or growing food and these things and it's like I can't walk into the city council with like a 10 point plan on how we can start harvesting gray water and rainwater off of like government buildings, right? But um, I can work with the allies I already have in those government systems, um, like Colleen, you know, with the Bernalillo County Open Space, um, you know, started with just like one project together and now we're doing all these different projects with the county. And the county has a lot of resources compared to our little gardening project, whose annual budget is like $25,000 a year, you know? Like they have a ton of resources that they can help um, develop these projects and these programs. And just yesterday I was planting a little seed in her ear about bringing some sheep actually onto the Sanchez site because the soil has been so eroded over time. So we're doing cover. Yes, okay, so let's talk about that. And she was completely, she was like, you know, well, I couldn't do it, but if you managed it, you know, it would be a possibility. And so it's like, okay, like I hear a yes in there and I can move forward with that agenda, but only based on this relationship that we've built and working together and building that trust. Um, I'm gonna answer Travis's question a little bit. I don't think we need, I don't really fully believe in the nonprofit industrial complex. I believe a lot of work can be done grassroots. In permaculture, they say loose systems work better than tight systems. So if you have a group of committed citizens, nonprofit paperwork and legal stuff, you could get caught up in that. So maybe you can find a fiscal sponsor so you can get donations, but move forward just with having the people power for now. That would be my and, other non Yeah, and partnership, you know, mm. because there's other nonprofits that are already doing that. You know, it, it is, I mean, just to start a nonprofit would be just so intense, but, you know, connecting and partnering is just a lot easier. But, you know, in terms of being effective in the community too, I mean, I think it's, the, the schools have been very effective for us in, in social justice work, you know, because it's a hub, you know, people are kind of concerned and caring about their children anyways, so, you know, by having food, we can talk about a lot of things, and 
you know, it's, it's really been awesome because moms are very concerned about the health of their kids, you know, and so we talk about dangerous chemicals on our food, you know, they're concerned and they want to hear this and, you know, just to give a shout out to all the moms and, and families that, you know, can't make it to conferences like this and, and don't have the same educational opportunities that some of us have had to learn these kinds of things. And so how can we share the information with our communities? And that's a big focus of ours is more education based and then that leads to health, you know, educating for health. But, you know, educating people and empowering people. Just, you know, and a couple people can move mountains, you know, I mean, we have a couple passionate people and that's really, I think, who we identify in communities that we work with, you know, the people that maybe are gatekeepers for their community in a school situation or people that are active and engaged and want to help and participate and kind of look for those and just cultivate together something really special.